Well, hello, and welcome to a Beatles show, a weekly podcast talk show, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four, their years together, their solo careers, their music, their albums, their history, any aspect of uh, Beatles history we can talk about here on the show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me from my other radio program, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. And uh, I'm being joined by my two other co-hosts. First of all, the man who uh, used to work at the New York Times, and he worked in their classical department. He was their Beatle guy there. Anytime there was an article to be written on the Beatles, it was written by him. And he's also gone on to write a few Beatle books. Most recently, the e-book, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and also the Beatles from the cavern to the rooftop. And that's our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. My other co-host, he's been the leading Beatles newsman on the internet for decades now, going from uh, the Abbey Road website to Beatles Examiner, more recently, Axis.com, AXS.com. He writes for Billboard, Variety, Goldmine. If they haven't hired him, then there's something wrong. Anyway, that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to be reviewing one of the Beatles albums, and that's their Beatles for Sale album. But before we do that, we always like to start off the show, if we have news items, to get to them. And we've got uh, several to start the show with. First of all, uh, very happy news. We were hoping this would happen here in the States because the Beatles animated film Yellow Submarine is going to be shown in the UK. We heard about that, but now we've heard it's going to be shown in movie theaters in the U.S. starting July the 8th. And Steve, I know you wrote an article in Billboard about that you want to tell the folks more Mm -hmm. actually the well the dates are going to be um different all over the country they haven't announced the they haven't put up the uh the actual dates yet um but they'll be different in different cities and the length of the engagements will be different i believe the um dates will be posted around the 17th um the website is yellowsubmarine.film uh, and that's where, and that's where actually where the British stuff is now, but the um, the American stuff will be there too. And actually, it's all North America; it's not just the U.S. Mm-hmm. So, and it's going to have a it's supposed to have a uh, a new 4K uh, digital upgrade and a, a new you know audio upgrade as well. People have been kind of wondering about that because you know the fact that I don't think so. Um, well, yeah, because the the DVD had that had was made from 4K, but um, and also the audio upgrade is it's the mix by Peter Cobbin, and Peter Cobbin mixed the 1999 one, and everything they've done since then has been Giles. So you have to assume that if they were mixing it anew, they probably would go to Giles for it, since he's now their go-to guy. Um, right. And that when you Ooh. see Peter Cobbin's credit, you kind of have to assume that that's the 1999 remix. Mm-hmm. Which is actually a great remix, because yeah. that, that, that we you know we saw that, and it was absolutely fantastic, especially the end with uh, It's All Too Much. It's just, that's that's one to die for. You have to see that. So... Mm. And hear that. So, and I've also read that the um, the actual digital cleanup for the film was done by hand and frame by frame. Well, they did of, that. Uh, but isn't that the same as 1999 too? I mean, well, they also did, did that. They? For the DVD. Yeah. they also did that for the DVD. I mean, that was the bl- the Blu-ray. That's that was all part of that. I mean, what this seems to to be is just a, a you know bringing it to the screen. Period. You know, so. You know, in other words, just celebrating the 50th anniversary by showing it in the theaters. But, but it should be a better digital print, right? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, you would you would it's, like it to be, but it's saying uh, a new 4K digital right. restoration. 
No, I I agree. And that's I'm not sure the, it was 4K in 1999. I don't, I don't remember people talking about 4K. No, it wasn't 4K in 1999. The Blu-ray was for it was taken from the 4K though. That because I went back to mm-hmm. sources and I went back and asked for a clarification on that one. So, mm. but anywho, so there we go. But it it is coming back into the theaters. That's the big news. And so far, there's no news about a reissue on DVD or Blu-ray. There doesn't look like there's going to be one because this is not a – it's not something they've redone since. So I don't expect that to happen. Is it not still in print? Yes, it's still in print. I'm pretty sure it's still in print. Yeah. I think this – I think the deal here is that this is just to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's really, that's really all it is. So. Okay. But it's still good news anyway. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's Nothing fun to like see that in on. the theater. Yeah. yeah, it is. That's where I first saw it. So, anyway. Okay. Also, we have news about Julian Lennon. Um, as we've mentioned before, he just released his second children's book, which is called Heal the Earth. This is the follow-up to his book called Touch the Earth, and it's geared towards children. It's all about the importance of our environment and protecting the planet. And he's been making the rounds lately. He was um, in New York City at Barnes & Noble signing books. And he was also interviewed by Dennis Elsis there uh, to talk about the book. And in addition to that, he was on the TV show called The Chew. He was in uh, L.A. Too. He did. He also signed in L.A. too. Right. Okay. And But the big news is that um, in addition to this book coming out, the company Gaumont has made a deal to make Julian's book trilogy into an animated TV series. So... Um, Julian and his uh, collaborator, the illustrator, Bart Davis, they will serve as executive producers for the series. We don't have any projected release date for it, but that's great news. And the ironic thing about this company, Gaumont, it's the same company that Paul McCartney is working with for his uh, full-length animated film, High in the Clouds. So uh, that's kind of a coincidence right there. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And Julian was also on that internet program that I mentioned in the last show called Build. It was a half-hour show um, that you can get only on a particular website called buildseries.com. So good news there for Julian. And as we know more about the the TV series, we'll let you know. There's also news about uh, new reissues of Paul McCartney's catalog. It was just announced that four of his titles are being reissued on CD also 180 gram vinyl and then 180 gram colored vinyl as well and that's for the titles for new chaos and creation in the backyard this is a big surprise to me wings greatest and also another surprise thrillington (laughs) well i think i think the surprise is that these are even coming out at all because they're all just single cds and really the only attraction is the colored vinyl i mean i i don't see i mean Certainly, there are people going to be interested, but I mean, there really isn't much here to to worry about. You know, uh, there these are not new mixes, uh, unfortunately, and there's no extra material. So, mm, how much um, more so Wellington did you want? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, why? You know, it is kind of funny that that on the BBC lately, Richard Hewson has uh, reappeared and, um, oh. you know, talking really about his orchestration for Long and Winding Road and how Paul was upset and not mentioning Thrillington at all. And um, But he was the one who arranged and conducted Thrillington. Doesn't I don't think he gets a credit on the album, but he was right. There. So it's it's funny that he's sort of reemerged in a Beatles context, but but without the context of the album that's being reissued now. Right. Yeah. It's also something that Paul had no hard feelings against Richard Houston, I guess, mm-hmm. if he hired him to, to work on Thrillington. Mm-hmm. So there you go. But also it's important to mention these titles because it brings it back into the catalog if it was ever out of print. I don't know if Wings Great has remained in print. But when you consider the fact that you had all the the compilations that followed, you had all the best. You had Wings, uh, I mean, um, Wingspan, and most recently, Pure McCartney. Why the need to bring back Wings Greatest? When all the songs that are on there, you can find in the other compilations. 
Yeah, so, maybe, maybe there are some people who probably have some sentimental connection with Wings Greatest from when it came out and, you know, would just like to have a new, a fresh vinyl copy. I don't know. Right. And also, as one of my listeners pointed out to me, um, Wings Greatest has the full version of Junior's Farm, mm. which didn't appear in Wingspan and also in Pure McCartney, although it was in the remastered Venus and Mars as a bonus track. Mm. So there you go. But uh, just nice to know that the catalog is being reissued just to keep everything in print. And uh, that'll tide us over until we get more news about Paul, his new album, his next new album, and the next remastered, which we still haven't heard anything about. Mm-hmm. Also, news about the Ed Sullivan show is coming out reissued on uh, DVD. Now, several years ago, there was uh, a two-DVD collection of the Ed Sullivan shows when the Beatles were on it, and they were the complete episodes. And it was really fun to watch because she not only had the Beatles, but all the other artists, all the other performers that were in those shows, and you even had the commercials from those shows. But not all and of them. Really? Yes, the cigarette commercials were taken out. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. You remember you you've probably that. you've probably seen <laughs> before they came out you probably have seen videotapes of the whole shows where remember Kent brought to you by Kent with the Micronite filter you can uh-huh. yeah that's gone. I don't know about the the reissue I don't know if they've put them back but I I kind of would doubt it. Okay. Well, it is being re-released now um all four shows in their entirety except for the cigarette commercials I guess. Uh well, we'll see. <laughs> Um, and that's on May the 25th. That's from Sofa Entertainment and Universal. Anybody want to comment on this? Well, it's just, it, it should be mentioned and should be underlined that these are not Blu-rays. The, they're just – the way it's described is these are just digital up, digital video upgrades in the regular DVDs. So there's there's no – and it's interesting because, as I commented to somebody this morning, the, the Beatles shows did not look bad. They looked actually pretty good. Now, the Elvis shows, because of their age, mm. you know, 56 and 57, did look, especially the the earliest ones, did look pretty worn. And those could use some real touch-ups. It'll be interesting to see what they've done to the Beatles show, though. Um, but the Beatles show never looked that bad. I, I should also mention that there's not going to be any new material in any of these um, the the only new thing, from what I can gather, is the Elvis performances only. I don't believe that that has been out before, rather than just the full shows. But the Elvis Great Performances has been out before. That was actually out as a three-DVD set, um, but they've shrunk it down to two, but they haven't taken anything out. And then the, the Supremes and the Temptations are two single DVDs apiece. Yeah, that should be fun because they were both on the show a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, I don't have I have the Elvis ones, uh, or I have m- most of the Elvis ones. I have the the Ed Sullivan one, and I have the the great performances. I don't have the um, the Supremes and the Temptations ones, but yeah, those should be fun because, uh, especially with the Supremes, you know, they changed from you know they they evolved from being just a a, a little-known singing group at the beginning to these megastars, you know, at the end, you know, fronted by Diana Ross. And, and uh, so, but yeah, that's that's going to be fun. And, and I mean, if you haven't seen the Beatles ones, the Beatles uh, set is a must for anybody that's listening to the show. You have to have that because you need to see the way they looked, you know, uh, on those shows, in context, uh, in context, mm. right? And and there's a lot of, I mean, among the people on those shows, there's Frank Gorshin, there's um, Davy Jones, and Davy Jones, that's right? Yeah, right. that's right too. Davy Jones is on there as part of the cast of Oliver. Mitzi there's Gaynor. Uh, Mitzi Gaynor, who I never mm. liked. Tessie, Tessie O'Shea, that song, <laughs> that song that that Mitzi Gaynor did has stuck in my head forever. I remember hearing it that night. Uh, and, uh, it was the second, their second appearance, and I still haven't gotten that thing out of my head. Tessie, did I say Tessie O'Shea? Tessie O'Shea, Morkum, mm-hmm. Morkum and Wise, right? Uh, who the Beatles appeared with? Uh, Cilla Black is on one of the shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
soupy sails. Yeah, that's right. You gotta ha- you gotta have the mouse. Gotta have the mouse. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of soupy, so that you know that's cool that he's. And there were a lot. Uh, uh, Senior Wentz. Should I do a set eye? <laughs> <laughs> So do yeah, you watch? Uh, do you watch um, on the Decades Channel? They have you know half hour. We don't get um, we don't get Decades here. Um, Directv has uh, FETV, which has Perry Mason and all sorts of things. TJ Hooker and started running the Monkeys on the weekend, which which was kind of a shock. Mm. Uh, but no, we don't have the Decades Channel, unfortunately. Uh, I get a big kick out of watching that show now, whenever I can. The Ed Sullivan Show. Oh, is it on there? Is it Ed Sullivan? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it, it's broken down. It's it's just half hour shows. Yeah, they, the only thing about watching those shows, the way they've broken them down over the years, is again it's out of context and they they insert a lot of graphics that you didn't see originally. Uh, it would be nice if they did what, for example, the Tonight Show did recently in the last couple of years and put them out as the shows were because that was. You know that was the really nice, as as they've done with the Beatles and Elvis and and, and well, by the way one release that isn't being reissued here that I'm really surprised about is the Rolling Stones because they also did a Rolling Stones one and the Rolling Stones one actually was kind of interesting because they put it out in several versions the the most widely available one was the four Rolling Stones show but they also put out a six Rolling Stone show that if you look on Amazon right now is very expensive because it got a, a limited release, apparently. It was always more expensive than the others. And why they didn't put out the full six shows as the release itself, I, I never understood. But there is the Rolling Stones one out there, and hopefully they'll reissue that. And hopefully they'll put the whole six shows out of that. Because those are, uh, you know, those are obviously really good. Because it, again, you have the Stones from the their first appearances to later on in '67, '68, uh, when you know Jagger was all dressed up in psychedelic clothes and all this, and they were. I think actually, uh, um, Mick Taylor had had come into the group by the time the last appearance had come around. So, mm. so, anyway. so before we get too far um, into the stones, we have yes. like at least four more items Sorry. of news. To get to. Sorry, about, <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to take that take that off to, uh, off of a uh, off into a tangent. There's okay. also it's also the Mojo. Uh, Mojo is issuing two red and blue issues that they've that you can get through them, and they're usually on uh, at Barnes and Noble. Uh, here about a month after they they get issued, the, there's the uh, the photo of Paul and Willie Nelson that came out on Instagram. Ken, I'm surprised you didn't mention that that might have been linked to the uh, to the news about McCartney about the uh, new album, which is what news? <laughs> well, I mean the eventual news. I mean, when you saw that photo, did you not think that maybe Willie Nelson might be involved with Paul's album? Not really. It could just okay. be something that that took place over the last few days. It was on Instagram, and uh, Willie Nelson's son took the picture. They could have been just jamming together for the fun of it. Maybe. Maybe they were writing a song for pa- Dolly Parton. There <laughs> you go. Because it was a Dolly Parton item, too, right? Was uh, it? One of you posted a thing about how much you hate TMZ. But I do. yet they had this thing about Paul and Dolly Parton having dinner. Oh, oh right, okay. I saw that. that's right too. Paul and Dolly Parton. That had nothing to do with this picture. At least I don't think it did. Did it? Not that we know of, but who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Let's start rumors. Let's Two start country TMZ. stars and Paul. Hey, you know. Let's start. TMZ Paul's making a country album. That's it. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, also, there's the news about Derek Taylor's book. As time goes by, being reissued. Yes, it's on. That's on Amazon now. Uh, it was uh, came out uh, four days ago on the fifth. Um, I have it, I have the date as May fifth, April fifth. No, it's out. And that's a good okay. book. Okay, on, that's on Amazon. Book. It listed as May. So, Derek was really a great writer, and uh, and and he wrote quite a bunch of books. I mean, in uh, the, there was the Genesis one, of course, that has the commentary from George. But as as time goes by, was earlier, and really just sort of looked over his career, which was an incredible career. I mean, the the people that he represented, apart from when he worked with the Beatles at the beginning and end, 
of the Beatles era uh, included, you know, the Birds, the Beach Boys, um, you know, just Paul Revere and the Raiders. Yeah, and and then he did. He was involved in Monterey Pop. Uh, mm -hmm. And and he discusses all of this in this book in that inimitable Derek Taylor style. You know, th this is a guy whose voice you can hear as you read his book. Right. And uh, I was lucky enough to get to know him a bit um, towards the end of his life. Um, I think the first time I might have interviewed him might have been in like 1987 when around the time of the, the Pepper special that he put together. Uh, for Granada TV, and and then later when the anthology was about to be televised, and I spent my week or whatever it was in London, Derek was my minder, you know. So I spent <laughs> a lot of time with Derek, Derek keeping me out of trouble, and also sitting in on some of the interviews here and there. But uh, he was just a great guy. I was really very sad when he died. How would Derek keep you out of trouble? Um, you know, he, you wouldn't want me, for instance, wandering around the Apple offices by myself, right? So Derek was always with me uh -huh. <laughs> when I was in that building. So, uh, yeah. Or if he left me with someone else, that would be me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you definitely had the feeling of, like, having a, a minder in a way. But, I mean, he, he did it really well because you know we'd go out to lunch and we'd talk about all kinds of stuff and uh you know he was just really he was really incredible i mean uh and he's definitely you know there was a huge hole in there when he wasn't involved with the beatles directly but he really is part of their story i mean he ghosted brian's book too he he ghosted cellar full of noise Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I think really anybody interested in this should read uh, As Time Goes By. It's a paperback. It's not expensive, and it's full of really great stuff. So I just thought I'd put in mm. my two cents hey, worth. Thank it. you. Yeah, and it, and it is out now, by the way. I, I just double-checked, but uh, but I, had, I uh, had written about it. So, yeah, it's definitely out now. And it's in, there... it's in, you can also get it in digital, too, uh, yeah. on Kindle. Mm. Are there transcriptions anywhere of your interview with, or interviews with Derek? Um, probably Beatle Fan published them at the time as QAs. Um, okay. Yeah, I think they did. But not online? No, sadly. Okay. Okay. And finally, um, there's news about, uh, well, we know more about the TV series on Brian Epstein being developed based on uh, the fifth Beatle the Vivek Tiwari book, and you wrote an article on that. Yes, Steve. I did. I, I interviewed the woman who is going to be the uh, executive producer, J Jenna S Santoyani. And I had trouble saying that when I was talking to her, <laughs> which is embarrassing for an Italian to really not be able to say another Italian's name. <laughs> but she and I talked for uh, about a half hour, and, and at this point, it's still a long ways off. There's a lot of things they're still working on. They do have a script, um, and they do have, as we all know, uh, Lennon-McCartney songs. They have the rights to that. Um, but the story talks about what they're – gives kind of an early idea of what they're looking at doing uh, and how the the uh, story is going to be put on the screen. It will be live action. That's one thing that I've heard many times from them and they you know they made a point to say make sure you say it's live action and it's not it's going to be a graphic novel it's not going to be animated that's not to say they may or may not use images from the graphic novel but they don't know yet what they're going to do that they're, they're, they're still a ways off in developing how it's going to work and it's going to be i would say a, a while i don't want to even give uh you know any kind of a timeline because I don't know it and they don't know it of when it's going to come out. So, Well, when I spoke to Vivek at the fest a month ago, he said not until at least next year. Well, uh, they they were even being less less definite with me on the phone. I mean, Miss Santuiani uh, wouldn't even pin it that far down. So that may – I don't know that they know. I really don't. Mm. Okay. I mean, I hope it's next year. You know, uh, it's been so long 
incoming. I mean, there's been so many hurdles and and things that they that have happened. You know, where it you know it ended up. It started being a, a movie, and and then it, now it's moved to television. The one thing that they did that she did talk about in the story was why television made a better um, home Shit. for yeah than the movies because you don't have to fit it up fit it in one episode you know so Mm -hmm. and you can and the story can can move a little better so but we'll see i mean it's it's still a ways to go still a ways off all right well there's something there to look forward to and so why don't we move on to our main topic for the show and that's reviewing the beatles fourth album called beatles for sale this was their follow-up to a hard day's night and there's a lot of things that have been said about Beatles for Sale in recent years. And if you read a lot of the the lists that have come out come up online of best albums from the Beatles or best to worst, usually Beatles for Sale ends up being somewhere at the bottom of the barrel there. And maybe we should talk about whether or not that's a fair um, assessment of the album or not. But I know that there are some people that look at the album as being somewhat of a disappointment because their previous album, A Hard Day's Night, was all original material, 13 songs, all Lennon-McCartney songs. And when they recorded Beatles for Sale, they went back to the formula of the first two albums, which was eight original songs and six cover versions of songs. So when you look back at this album now, do you just think it's a natural progression of what the Beatles went through? Did you think it was an upgrade in any way from A Hard Day's Night, or was it somewhat of a disappointment? Why don't we start with you, Alan? Okay. um, I wouldn't say it was an upgrade. I'm not sure I would say it was a disappointment either. In terms of it being towards the bottom of the list, I mean, I kind of agree with that. But the thing is that if you're going to have a list with the top and the bottom, something has to be down there. You know, and Beatles for Sale is as good a candidate as any. But there's, you know, a lot to be said about the stuff on this album. Um, Yes, it's true that going back to the 8 and 6 format for the last time did seem a disappointment after Hard Day's Night. But another thing that seemed, in a way, maybe not a disappointment, but uh, startling after a Hard Day's Night is that Hard Day's Night was just so bright and energetic and you know hard driven and like out there it was an explosion of it it was as if as if they were saying after their first two albums and their you know tours that took them to the u.s they hadn't gone to australia yet but they had you know they'd had the success that they wanted and it's hard day's night was like hey we made it and Beatles for Sale strikes me as after the summer tour um, of 64, even though they started it before they left, I think it, it sounds to me like between the lines they're saying, this really is tiring being out there on tour going all over the world. It's like it's beginning to take it out of us. And so you see a lot of self-doubt in you know things like I'm a loser and... Um, it just seems a little more down to me, this album as a whole. And even though there are things like Eight Days a Week, which, you know, could is, everything I said about Hard Day's Night applies to Eight Days a Week. It's like, it's bright, it's out there, it's great, it's fun. But a lot of it has a more sort of down feeling in, in a certain way. And I listened to the, uh, I took out my British vinyl, played it, yesterday and uh mm-hmm. you know and i was trying to figure out exactly why i feel that way and there's i guess that run of i'm a loser babies in black but then it goes to rock and roll music um mm-hmm. so it's up and down but i don't think there was as much down before this i do want to mention the um the cover because you know the cover is especially in those days really a big part of an album's package if you look at the uh, at this cover, on the front, you've got this very sort of autumnal picture of them, but you've got George with the point 
on his hair that that Robert Freeman seemed to have liked so much, and uh, you know, Ringo's got a scarf on. It's it's it it kind of captures in a way that feeling of you know it's not spring or summer anymore. It's it's uh, you know we're we're chilling out a bit. On the back is the cover that we in the U.S. know as the cover of Beatles '65. It's uh, not it's not Beatles '65. Um, early Beatles. Beatles. Um, yeah, you know, again, autumnal look at all the leaves around them that are, you know, a bit green, but also brown, but no songs mentioned, you know, you have to open up the album and you, which, you know, you couldn't do till you got home, I guess. Although I don't know if in, in Britain, did they use shrink wrap in those days? I'm not sure. Maybe not. I think, I think they did. <laughs> yeah. There's no picking up the album, looking on the back and saying, oh yeah, I like No Reply. I'll get this one. You know, it's, a, it's, uh, this is our album. You can take it on faith, you know? And then inside you've got this like black and white double spread where you've got the songs, you've got uh, some notes about who's doing what, you know, no reply, double track, John, occasionally Paul, Paul, George, join both on the chorus. In the center, between the list for what's on side one and side two, you have an essay by the late, great Derek Taylor, who we were just talking about. And uh, then you see a performance shot of them. All the pictures, I guess, are by Robert Freeman. And across from it, there's this interesting picture of the Beatles in front of all of these sort of Victorian kind of pictures. I'm not sure exactly what that's about. Uh, you know, you've got <laughs> George leaning into the armpit of an actress and, you know, these... these You've got guys with guns on horses that look like they're uh, you know, in the <laughs> desert of the Middle East. And, um, you know, and then you see a vaudeville pair up in the the right side top. So, you know, it's just a, it, it, it's really a fascinating production all around, you know, the music and the cover. And it all, for me, seems to fit together really well. So mm. not sure what yeah. else to say. Hmm? Well, I like what you said about songs having more down moments. Not necessarily more down than up, but you start the album with three very down songs mm -hmm. about relationships that have failed. Right. And yet at the same time, there is growth in the songwriting. Oh, definitely. Because, uh, you know, you look at something like I'm a Loser, which I know, you know a lot of people point to You've Got to Hide Your Love Away as being, you know, like the first... Dylan S. song from John, but I, I point to I'm a loser in that regard. Mm -hmm. Very introspective stuff. And I like the fact that, like in a song like Babies in Black, there's a third person there in the song, kind of like She Loves You in a way. Right. Yeah. You know, but that's interesting. It wasn't like a one on one relationship there that you're writing about. Right. You know, it's not about necessarily you're not getting along with your girlfriend or, or she's not getting along with you. There's a third person involved. So that adds that kind of element to it. But, um, and then you yes. get back to the down stuff towards the end of the album where you've got, you know, I don't want to spoil the party. So I'll go, right. you know, and, and then followed by what you're doing, you know, which is uh, Paul saying, you know, you think about what you're doing to me here, you know, mm -hmm. and, there's the country aspect on this album, which is stronger than, you know, we we may not have known at the time how much they were into country in their formative years as, as one of the many influences, but it really comes out a lot on this album. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to do the Carl Perkins songs, mm -hmm. you know, but it's another thing to insert it into the original songs, like I'm a Loser as a real, you know, country and Western rockabilly feel to it. And I'll Follow the Sun. Old as that was, that song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Uh, Steve, what about uh, your thoughts on Beatles for Well, I have, I have a little bit of a different take on this. Um, I see the album as a whole as a kind of an experiment because especially coming after A Hard Day's Night with all the screaming and the, you know, and the teen and the, and the, the whole... Beatlemania aspect. Hmm. Beatles for Sale turns a little more serious. They get, they seem to start looking like I, I don't want to say looking like adults, but that's really kind of 
the first thing I thought of because of they go right into no reply. And the words, you know, and the the opening lyrics, uh, this happened once before I came to your door, no reply. They said it wasn't you. I saw pe- you peek through your window. I nearly died. That's not, she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite a, that's quite a change from that. And I think, and, and although the whole album doesn't go that route, there's a little bit of going back and forth on this album that way. I mean, you know, you have rock and roll music, which besides being a Chuck Berry cover, is also kind of a a, a, a retro back to the Cavern, you know, uh, Ham- even Hamburg, you know. And you have, I mean, you have a variety of song styles here. You have I'm a Loser, which really kind of goes beyond what he said in help it's another extension of you know of uh you know of help i mean it's another extension he, of he hadn't had crying. help yet so help mm. is an extension of it okay all right. <laughs> all, right, right. all right the babies in black has beautiful harmonies all, all of the sun seems to foreshadow yesterday um although it's not as good as that i think that it does mr moonlight is one that i could probably live without and actually, I was listening to uh, an outtake of it uh, this morning, and I actually thought the outtake was better because they were having a little fun with it. I think they probably took it a little too seriously, and I think it would have been more fun if they hadn't. You know, uh, eight days a week is is you know the, is a classic, is is you know one of their biggest hits ever, and I think it's a, it's a great song. Kansas City is Paul singing his butt off as you know like Little Richard. Honey Don is a great uh, country tribute to Carl Perkins, and and I it it, made, it actually made me wonder how they ever decided what songs Ringo was going to sing. I mean, he got uh, Honey Don would have been great for George to sing. I mean, that would have been you know, and of course he does. Everybody's trying to be my baby at the end. Uh, well, John John used to sing Honey Don. Right. It, it's just a, a question of why. You know, why give that one to Ringo? Why didn't they let John do it? You know, why didn't they give Ringo something else? Well, they probably else? needed Ringo. They needed a song for Ringo to sing. They hadn't written him one, so... Right, right, you know, right. But, I mean, it, it, why, you know... Maybe it was his was choice. That, that's possible, too. We we don't know. We don't know. Words of Love is a, a, a great uh, Buddy Holly, you know, uh, song. Um, Every Little Thing could have been a Buddy Holly song. <laughs> it, 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 sound, it almost sounds like one. I don't want to spoil the party. Is I think is a, is actually I like I don't want to spoil the party a little better than eight days a week. Maybe because the words are a little better. What you're doing is another kind of Buddy Holly type Lennon and McCartney song. And everybody, like I said, everybody's trying to be my baby. It's just, it's great. And that's uh, you know it's if George had to have a, a really good song on that album, uh, that's it because uh, it's it's uh, a fantastic version that he does and he. He looks like he's having a blast singing it, but it, it, it overall though, uh, I I really see this as kind of an experiment. Part of it worked, part of it didn't, and also, Alan, I'm surprised you didn't mention the title of the album, Beatles for Sale. Mm-hmm. I mean that that really that says a lot there. I mean they were in a way they were kind of protesting the way that they were being marketed, and that. You know that they were, and and they, you know, they had the grumpy faces on the cover. You know, there's there's so much there's so much there. That might be a stretch. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, I, I, I've I've heard that. I've seen people say that before about the grumpy faces on the cover. I'm not. I mean, I, I'm not going to necessarily buy that, but it, it goes into the serious, the whole serious aspect of the album of getting away from the, you know, from the Fab Four type and 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 growing up a little bit that in, that in, I th- in terms of getting away from the fat four type what what would you think about this album as a kind of you know alternative universe where you know you look at no reply i'm a loser babies in black uh i don't want to spoil the party what you're doing and you're thinking wait a minute these are the beatles i don't think they have that kind of girl problem you know what i mean they had yeah. women, women flinging themselves at them. They, you know, well, you, that's, you sort of... I mean, that's, abso- that's absolutely true. But who's to say that Lennon and McCartney couldn't imagine 
Oh, sure, they you could know. imagine it. I mean, the history of pop song is 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 that, and and they were masters of pop song. It's just that when you listen to it, you're thinking, "Wait a minute, wait a minute." I don't think the reality is quite like that. You know, no, maybe that's, back that's, when they were teenagers. <laughs> that that's true, but I mean, look at the songs on the album, though. Mm-hmm. They're all relatively. Except for maybe uh, everybody's trying to be my baby is is the closest thing to a to a, a she loves you type song really, you know, isn't it? I mean, all the others uh, are are somewhat serious. Uh, yeah, everybody's they're, trying they're to be so... my baby. Actually, even though they didn't, they didn't write it, really more reflects the reality of what their life was at the time. Right. Right, but uh, but the uh, and the other songs are a lot more serious. Mm-hmm. It's that serious turn, except for Kansas City. I think you know you got to make an exception there because I mean it was a that was a straight out uh, little Richard cover. But you know uh, it it just seems like there was kind of a, a little bit of a turn on this album, uh, a little well, bit of, away from the from the the boyish Beatles to a more adult Beatles. Well, so. that's the fun thing about them is to notice an evolution mm-hmm. with every album, whether you think it's growth in them as a band, I still think there's growth yeah. on this album. And the thing is, you know, I think a lot of people might look as cover versions and not take them seriously because we all, one of the reasons why we love the Beatles so much is because of all the original songs that they came up with and, you know, what great songwriters they are. But um, the cover versions are just dynamite. And so if well, the cover yeah. versions are really good, I mean, I'm just saying because, you know, a lot of people consider this to be a disappointment after a hard day's night. You know, for someone like myself, because I was exposed first to the American albums, where everything was kind of diluted, you didn't really understand how everything was happening, happening chronologically mm-hmm. and accurately the way it was in England. But once you go from a hard day's night to Beatles for Sale and you've got all this energy on a hard day's night. Every song is Lennon and McCartney. It's like it's like Alan said. They arrived. They made it. And it shouldn't be looked at as a disappointment that they're doing a lot of covers here. They only did it because they had a deadline to fill, and they had they had to come up with some material. And it was much easier for them to rely on songs that they've been doing since the 50s, some of them, and in Hamburg. So they could knock those out very quickly. But some of these cover versions, like rock and roll music, to me, you know, my favorite of all the Beatle covers is is Bad Boy. But I love rock and roll music. I mean, there's so much energy in that. Kansas City, hey, 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 great vocals from Paul, killer version right there. Words of love. I mean, the harmonies there from the Beatles, which it, it just it gives you a, a little more depth in the song than than Buddy Holly's version, though I love Buddy's version. I don't want to always compare the Beatles to the originals because I love a lot of the originals too. But um, you know, words of love, it just, the harmonies are just so wonderful. Yeah, it's like and Everly it, Brothers do Buddy Holly. In a right, way. right, yeah. yeah. And then, like like we said, that country and western element. I don't want to spoil the party is one of the the best examples of of rockabilly for an original song from the Beatles. As is, I'm a loser, to me. You know, great material here all around. Everybody's trying to be my baby. And, um, you know, I, I just like the fact that some of the songs are negative here. You got to see a foreshadow of what was to come. Because there were a lot of negative songs that were written later on, mm-hmm. especially, say, in Rubber Soul, mm-hmm. you know. So it mm-hmm. kind of foreshadowed what was to come right there. Right. But well, here- like, again, like, again, like I said, I, I think it, you know, I, I still hold with what I said about it take, them taking a, a little serious turn. I think that I think that this definitely. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not criticizing this album as being as being a disappointment. Although I think some of the, like I said, I think Mr. Moonlight is one song that is. But I think there's there's a lot happening here, and I think you have to look at it that way. Another thing too is if you go between. Um, the American albums at the time, which would have been Beatles 65 and Beatles 6, the songs that, that got used on those albums that didn't make Beatles for sale are kind of interesting. Um, you know, there, I mean, there's, uh, uh, you know, I'll Be Back is not is not there. Um, but it's on Hard Day's you know. Night. Right. But I, I'm, I'm saying, well, I mean, because 
Oh, because they had sliced it off Hard Day's Night, right. but not yet right. put it on. I see. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, there's a, a, that too, and also the mixes were a little different. But in any event, yeah. I, I mean, there's there's some good stuff and some bad, some some okay stuff. But I think overall, this you know this thing works. I think it works. There's some brilliant guitar either. playing on it too. Um, There's another thing that struck me the other day, yesterday when I was listening to it. You know, not that it's any guitar playing I hadn't been hearing all these years, but just right. listening to the album start to finish. I mean, Babies in Black is you know that guitar is very. So he's, he's using that whammy bar a bit, you know, to mm-hmm. sort of get it uh, a, a little sour, which um, suits the song perfectly. But also, George is playing in Honey Don't and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. I mean, that is like, you know, move over, Carl Perkins. Like, I have right. mastered the style. And mm. uh, and it, it really... And, and plus, we have the roots of slide guitar, of George's slide guitar in I'll Follow the Sun. Not quite... I never the, thought about it that way. But. Yeah, because it's not the kind of playing that we're used to hearing him do he he really 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 developed it over the years but this is the first example i can think of where it appears interesting uh no i wouldn't have, i wouldn't have thought of that at all because it's not flat slide guitar but it's you're right there is there is that similarity interesting i got a question mm-hmm. what is the problem that many people have with mr moonlight I mean, it's often written up as being the worst song the yeah. Beatles ever recorded, and I honestly don't understand why. I mean, to open with John's vocals so yeah. powerful like that, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of the great introductions <laughs> on a Beatles record, too. I have a theory. Uh, I think <laughs> What's that? What? Uh, apart from the dinosaurs thin on one end, thick in the middle. Um, <laughs> I think it's the Hammond organ. Mm. I think it's just that, you know, because I was li- again, I was listening to it thinking, OK, why do I consider Mr. Moonlight sort of towards the bottom of the Beatles list? Because you do have that incredible vocal and it actually is a pretty tightly played track and it, it was seemed fine. And I thought, well, maybe it's that that Hammond organ isn't something that we're really used to hearing on a Beatle record. I mean, it came on again later. But maybe maybe it's just that it it just doesn't seem like the right sound, you know. And uh, you know, later on, I think one reason people might find Mr. Moonlight disappointing is because if you know that they had a choice between that and Leave My Kitten Alone, I think a lot of people, including me, would have chosen Leave My Kitten Alone. Mm, not me. But then you see, here's the thing: <laughs> when Leave My Kitten Alone became a famous outtake from these sections that people were clamoring and clamoring, and clamoring for, un- until you know Sessions was going to be released and finally it was going to come out, and then it wasn't. Came out on anthology. I kind of think if it was the opposite, if Leave My Kitten Alone was on this album, and we had heard that there was an outtake of Mr. Moonlight, we'd have all been clamoring for that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. I think well, the use of that organ gave the song more of a bossa nova type feel, which made it very different mm-hmm. for a Beatles record. Mm-hmm. Much and the that, same way that even though it wasn't released at the time, something like Besame Mucho, mm-hmm. you know, was was an unusual song mm-hmm. for the Beatles to record. Although, look, the Beatles are all over the place musically. But I think, um, you know, that organ gave that song a different feel. And when you listen to, say, the Beatles at the Star Club, version where you have george doing the lead guitar part doesn't work as well it really doesn't Hmm. so i think it was a a good choice i mean some people call it a cheesy sound that organ sound but i think it it worked in this arrangement now see i i think that's where my objection to the song lies is the is the rhythm it sounds too much like a calypso rhythm and it just and i don't think it fits the beatles very well i think that's where i think that's what i have a problem with the, it's not just the Hammond organ, though. It's it's the the chunky rhythm, you know. That's what I think bothers me. So, well, we have a difference of opinion there. Mm-hmm. Also, interesting how early on the Beatles were doing "I'm a Loser" in concert, and they dropped it in favor of "Babies in Black." Mm-hmm. And it seemed like you know they were very proud of "Babies in Black." Was it because it was a waltz? What you know? What was the reasoning? Why do you think? 
that they like that song so much to include it, you know, on tour when they performed. Hmm. I think the fact that it was in three rather than four, as you say, the the waltz uh, meter uh, may have been a contributing factor just because it gave them, you know, a little bit of variety in terms instead of having every song be in four, you have one breaking it out into three. Mm-hmm. You know, and and John yeah. often mentioned, you know, this one's a waltz, and uh, that seemed to have been important to them. I guess. Huh. Any thoughts, Steve? I know, I, I don't think I can improve on that. I mean, it, it, <laughs> would, it, the rhythm, I guess, on "I'm a Loser" probably was just didn't didn't work as well in concert as 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 "Babies in Black" did. Um, I think they sounded great doing it live. "I'm a Loser." I mean, to me, I'm a Loser has the same feel as Help, even though Help was later. So I don't see what the problem was with I'm a Loser. I'm just guessing here as to why they they went they ch- they changed to Babies in Black in concert. Here, here's another theory with Help and Babies in Black. You know, the song starts and it goes continuously. With I'm a Loser, they've got to sing. You know, the opening I'm a Loser and stop. I'm a loser mm-hmm. and stop. And with all that noise going on, maybe it was too complicated to, you know, they got to do the harmonies, come back in at the same time. And, and it's, you know, they didn't have stage monitors even. So, you know, maybe they decided to go for something that they just start and go continuously through without starts and stops. That's a good point because Paul brought up the same thing for Nowhere Man. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right? Did you say that about when they were doing the the songs in uh, Japan? Mm. They were doing the song in Japan. I think I think you said that about that. So that's a similar thing, right there. Starting with just vocals like that. Yeah. You know, it might have been a, a little bit difficult. Yeah. So. You know, under normal conditions, if they were playing to a quiet audience, uh, you know, that would be one thing. But on the conditions they were playing under, I think, made. Uh, things like that a little more complicated than they needed to be and uh, and and maybe they had that in mind i mean it's just a theory i have i have no direct knowledge of it but it makes sense okay i've got one big question to ask the both of you Uh-oh. and um <laughs> was the <trousers>. you know <laughs> <laughs> really you know, we just said that Beatles for Sale, the reason why the Beatles had to do all the covers is because they were under a deadline. They were so busy in 1964. Well, you know, they were busy in 1965. They were still doing plenty of concerts. They made a film in 64. They made a film in 65. And yet they had two albums in 1965 that, with the exception of Act Naturally, it was all original. And Dizzy Miss Lizzie. And this, I'm sorry. There you go. So what's the difference? Well, they were getting better at, at, at producing songs quickly, you know, and maybe they just didn't, they just hadn't had the machinery cranked up quite so, so much by the time of Beatles for Sale. I mean, this is, this is one of the insights from Mark's book that um, I've, I've had some trouble with, but I can see in a way the proof of it on Beatles for Sale. You know, Mark... We, we always thought about the Beatles as, you know, incredible songwriters and always bought the story about how they had a, a notebook with a hundred songs in it before they were even signed. But, you know, Mark Lewison in, in his book sort of talks about how they were not initially uh, songwriters primarily. They were much more of a cover band and the songwriting thing came later and they very reluctantly did it publicly and... Um, I think what we're seeing with Beatles for Sale and the decision to go back to covers for a lot of it is that the the songwriting machinery at the level they had to do it hadn't really cranked up fully. I mean, apart from the fact that there are six covers, you know, I'll Follow the Sun goes back to 1960 at least. So, oh, before that. Yeah, before, before that. Uh-huh. So, you know, so they're not only bringing in the covers, but it's like if we got any of the really old ones that we can turn into a feasible song now, and that's that that's what they had. Of course that, you know, you could say that about when I'm 64 and it's not as if Sgt. Pepper was a, you know, fallow period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very interesting right there. And you know, I, I like to bring this up and of course it's all conjecture. It always fascinates me what songs the Beatles chose to cover 
because just when you witness all the songs they did on BBC Radio that they covered, they could have picked any of those other songs that they didn't release for EMI. I mean, they had all those songs in their arsenal, and yet they picked these particular songs. So mm -hmm. I always wonder why these were the ones that were chosen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So any further thoughts about the album? No. I don't think so. I mean, I when I listened to it um, yesterday, I, I, I actually liked it a lot more than other times. Um, I, I have one question for you, though. Um, okay. Okay. If... You're, if if you were ranking the Beatles albums, and something has to be at the top and something has to be at the bottom, where would you put Beatles for sale, and what would you put below it? That's really tough because I think of every Beatles album as being great, of course, or near great. So it's like ranking every Beatles album a ten, except there might be a nine in there. <laughs> you know, it's like that's a sin. You know, I mean, do you, do you consider Yellow Submarine to be a Beatles album with half George Martin music hmm. yeah, and only four new songs, really? That's true. You know? That's true. But that's and, a movie soundtrack, so you, you have sort of like a built-in asterisk excuse, you know. Okay. Do you consider Magical Mystery Tour really an album? Mm -hmm. You do? Yeah, I think okay, so. Okay, that's... All right. Um, it's it's really tough. <laughs> it's it very tough. I abstain. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's it's too tough. Maybe this one, probably, uh, I guess. But that's no sin, you know, because <laughs> they're all great as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes it kind of bothers me when when people think that just because they went back to doing covers, it has to be weaker. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the case because their covers were so strong. You know what it's like, Ken, to, to, to segue into my other life a little bit? Someone comes to you with, with Beethoven's third, fifth, seventh, and ninth symphonies and says, mm. which is the worst? <laughs> you, know, you just can't. You just can't pick one. Right. Hmm. Well, good point. I, yeah, I, know, I, I, I mean, off of what you just said, Ken, I, I don't think it's the covers that – hurt this album at all i the covers actually are, are really good i think it's the some of the originals that um that bring this album down if it's if you're going to bring it down at all but what that, originals do you have a problem with well i i, I I'll, I'll change that and say uh, i don't like i already said i don't like mr moonlight but uh, i mean some of the some of the originals uh i don't think I, i'm a loser is the strongest song on the album i think it's a good song uh -huh. I don't think it's strong. I don't think it's the strongest. I don't think I'll follow the sun is strongest. And I already and I and I said I I thought eight days a week was kind of under. I don't want to spoil the party. That doesn't mean it's it's a weak song. But I, I think it's I think it's the 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 Lennon and McCartney songs that kind of because this is they aren't as this is not uh, you know Abbey Road or or Sgt. Pepper. It's not. No, That's but for just... its time and seeing how they changed and evolved and grew a bit, it's it's fascinating, and they're still good songs, good to great, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I think they're good. I think I think good is is probably the word. I don't know that great is the word I would use for every song in this album, but but in any event, uh, uh, you know, they were as as I said, they were growing and progressing, and and it they were making they were making some changes and. With changes, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And, you know, from here on, you know, we know what happened next, and, and they took off. I mean, they really took off after, you know, in the years after this. So It's kind of interesting to me that, uh, as we all know, the Beatles looked at singles and albums as separate entities, even though A Hard Day's Night in Help had singles from the albums. But the Beatles themselves never looked at Eight Days a Week as being a single. You know, and it, it was a single here, and obviously <laughs> people mm -hmm. loved it. It went to number one. So their judgment of the songs may not have been well absolutely perfect, but then at the same time they had I Feel Fine to contend with. So right. that, that said, according to Derek Taylor's note, the th other three other songs were considered as singles, and that was Eight Days a Week, No Reply, and I'm a Loser, before John came up with I Feel Fine. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you about eight days a week. And in fact, I was going to say that, you know, in, in interviews towards the end of his life, when he would go over all of the songs, you know, in various 
you know, like the Playboy interview, etc. Um, mm. John always sort of downplayed eight days a week. You know, yeah, this is an example of craft. You know, it's not. I love eight days a week. I think that is a spectacular song. I love the fade in intro. I love the sound of the guitars. I love the vocal harmonies. And then when the outtakes came out on anthology i thought those were great too i i i I couldn't figure out how they decided which approach to take because they were both incredible you know the the vocal harmonies at the beginning instead of the guitar fade in for instance i just i mean okay it's it's not a day in the life but i just love that song how many songs are a day in the life so (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. yeah but uh, I mean, that's the beauty of, you know, in studying this catalog. It's my opinion that the Beatles could have released far more singles than they did, <laughs> you know, and they could have done well, you know. But there was that avalanche in the first half of 1964 in America because we were catching up with the last year and a half. Right. And so all these other songs were coming out. And then they had to just kind of slow down and only release singles as they were coming out in the U.K., And, of course, there were the exceptions here in America, like Eight Days a Week and Nowhere Man was a single here. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you could have picked so many of these album cuts and they could have been hits. And I really think I'm a Loser was, I think that's one of the best songs on the album, Steve. But I think that could have been a single. But I'm sure a lot of people listening could say, oh, you know, rock and roll music could have been a single. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No Reply could have been a single. Um, At first, Paul thought that every little thing possibly could be a single and then brian brian epstein thought that it wasn't strong enough hmm. so um at least that's what's in um many years from now so uh yeah but it's still fascinating to study and um you know even if you want to consider this there the bottom of the barrel it's still a great album <laughs> well i didn't no i i would not consider it the bottom of the barrel uh but like i said i think the, I'll stand by what I said about they were going through changes, and and that's what this was. So right. well, since since Alan put me on the spot, Steve, yes, well, you consider it to be their their weakest album. <laughs> Ooh, that's 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 nasty. Um, <laughs> One good turn. <laughs> yeah, really. Gosh, that's hard. That's really that's a tough one. I don't know. Maybe maybe this is the weakest album. Maybe this is the weakest album. Um, but again, I mean, you know, it's it's to 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 say it's a weak album is really taking the whole thing out of context. I mean, because I didn't say that. No, I'm no, saying I, it. I'm okay, saying yeah, it. I'm okay. saying to to you know, for me to if I have you know if I call that a weak album that that has a double meaning and. Like I said, I think I'm I'm looking at it as an experimental album. I mean, if if you want to, if you really want a weak album, I guess Let It Be is probably weak. You know, compared this is uh, this is stronger than Let It Be, no doubt. Is so it, is it stronger than Get Back, the Glenn Jones no. version? <laughs> no, no, it's not. And I and I'm still and I've you know I've said this before that that is what they should have put out. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but. I think yeah, this, I mean, this is uh, room for another show. <laughs> do you, do you think, all right, I'm going to hit you back with one. Do you think this is stronger than the, this is, uh, is, let it be is stronger than this? Yes. Okay. Okay. I do. I mean, the only song on Let It Be that I don't really care for, I mean, not counting Maggie May and Dig It, you know, and all that, but I've, I've never been a huge fan of Dig a Pony. Hmm. Okay. But all the other songs are just wonderful on there, you know. Okay. Uh, you can't top "Let It Be" and "The Long and Winding Road" and two of us. And those are all really great songs across the universe. And I love the Phil Spector version of it too. Hmm. I'll let it be. But anyway, <laughs> that about wraps things up. We'll we'll have to reserve uh, this conversation for another show. Okay. Okay. So why don't we uh, give our folks our contact information, beginning with Alan. You can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. Short and sweet. Mm-hmm. Steve? BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com is my email address. Uh, I have a 
a Beatles group called Beatles News and Information, and you can get to the show. You can send your comments, nasty letters, and whatever to uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. You can find the show uh, for download on Podbean and on iTunes. You can stream it on YouTube. We're all over the place. And the YouTube page has a playlist where you can easily take a listen to all our all the interviews we've done, including the, the Elliot Mintz interview that was our last show that we got a lot of compliments for, and we thank you all for that. Yes. Um, Believe me, uh, we were we were very very happy with that show. Uh, we we thought we that show was just it was really a, a great uh, talk and uh, and uh, somebody suggested we should get him back and believe me we we are that has not uh, that is a suggestion we will definitely consider. We um, certainly hope to. Certainly hope to. Um, anyway, that's. How you can get a hold of me? I think I think I got I think I hit everything there. Ken, um, did you give our email address? Yes, things we said today. Radio show at gmail dot com. Okay. As for me, uh, you can always email me at every little thing at att dot net on my website kenmichaelsradio dot com. Uh, I'm now giving away that brand new tribute CD to George Harrison from Randy Bachman called "By George by Bachman." You can win it two ways in my latest special contest, and it's also one of nine prizes that you can win as part of my weekly Beatles trivia. I also want to mention that there's another Beatles podcast show called Two Legs, which is all solo Paul McCartney in the show. Tom Hunyadi and David Gargolino are the co-hosts of that show, and I was on a recent broadcast of that program, and also Kid O'Toole joined us, and we talked about Paul's Pipes of Peace album, which was a very big album for Kit. It was uh, through that album that she started to become a Beatle fan because actually from from hearing Paul's music with Michael Jackson and then uh, she started buying Paul's solo music and that was the first album that she bought, solo-wise from Paul. So if you want to hear that show, it's also on Podbean, podbean.com, and the name search, just type in Paul McCartney and it'll show the program Two Legs and where it going to be in either the newest one or next to newest one all right and uh so that's about it this has been a fantastic show i want to thank everybody for listening and for steve marinucci and alan cozen this is ken michaels again saying thanks so much for tuning in and we will see you next time 